Hello everyone. Welcome back from the uh, break. I, I saw outside that everyone was really actively engaged in conversation. I hope that's because you were inspired by the lightning talks and not just because uh, you were needing uh, to complain about the coffee. Uh, but welcome back to the second session of Collaborations Workshop. Um, we have our first keynote speaker, Usman Hack, who is the founding partner of Umbrellium uh, and also uh, Thingful, which is a search engine for Internet of Things. Uh, Usman originally trained as an architect, and we've been having a really interesting discussion about how he's felt that actually, although training as an architect, going into Internet of Things has not really seemed to be a jumping off into a different area. It's just an extension of where he first came from. So he originally uh, started creating things like responsive um, environments and interactive installations um, and has done things uh, all across the world, winning a number of different awards along the way. Uh, we are delighted to have him as our keynote speaker for the Collaborations Workshop, uh, where he's going to be talking about Internet of Things or ecosystems of environments. Please welcome Usman. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, yes, I am, uh, by background, I'm an architect, uh, which means that I'm really interested in people and their relationship to space. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is kind of about what happens when people, technology, environments all kind of intersect. I'm going to be talking about the work I've done over the last 10 years. I'm going to be focusing just on the last 10 years. Um, and I'm going to be particularly talking about the stuff that's kind of fallen under this category of the Internet of Things. Uh, but I want to sort of try and reframe the Internet of Things, which I think has tended to be quite an, an individualistic, atomized approach to connected, connecting single objects. And think instead about ecosystems of environments, which is a much more complex idea of many different things interconnected, in interconnecting in very different ways. Um, the work that we do at Umbrellium, is, it spans quite a wide variety, and I'm not necessarily going to touch on all of it, but on the one end, we might do sort of citizen engagement spectacles that might work with several hundred thousand people in one night. So, for example, up there, you can see in Singapore, we got together, uh, brought together uh, thousands of members of the public who designed and erected and control the massive 18-story structure uh, that sort of uh, floated in there uh, on their city horizon. We designed sort of three-dimensional um, uh, 3D environments as it's kind of constructed with lasers, worked with the city of New York on, a, on an app for crowdsourcing um, noise uh, level monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the stuff that I want to talk about is, is essentially the Internet of Things and sort of, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily going to give you the, the beginner's guide to it. I want to actually assume that you kind of know a little bit about IoT, but I want to present a different perspective on it, I hope. The common theme across all of the work uh, that, uh, that I try and do is this idea of figuring out how to build those tools for empowering citizens. Now, that means two quite specific things. When I'm talking about citizens, I'm talking about groupings of people, people that have self-organized into groups and not acting individually. And when I'm talking about empowering, I'm talking about the idea that um, by doing this, they're exceeding their expected potential. They're actually going beyond what they thought they could do on their own. And that's the kind of common theme. No matter what the project is, no matter what the scale is, I'm always trying to look at that that way. Now. Just to give you a, 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 a sort of a, a marker, a line in the sand for, for what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the Internet of Things, there is this kind of old idea of machine to machine or M2M, which you might have heard. And this has been around, frankly, for decades. Um, you know, ever since the 70s, we've had the idea of remote monitoring systems, telemetry systems, um, oil pipeline monitoring, or what have you. Uh, it might have been clunky and slow. It might not necessarily even have been on a network. But the idea of remote monitoring is not necessarily new. Now, in that old paradigm, you might deploy a bunch of sensors that were your own sensors. They would generate data just for yourself. 
for your business or your organization or what have you. And then you would operationalize that data in some way. You would derive the value, if you like, from the sensor deployment uh, that, that you had made. One of the kind of ideas of the Internet of Things, if you will, and this is perhaps just my personal perspective on it, is that there's a paradigm shift of this connectivity where you're not just deploying stuff for yourself but that the real opportunity comes about because the stuff that you deploy is generating data that might be valuable to others that might actually only be valuable because others are making use of it and so in a sense the transition is or the, the ideal transition is from data silos to interacting data and from single products to services from limited value, if you like, to, to unlock value. But I don't think we're actually quite there yet. You know, with all the products that we see on the market, all the kind of conversations around the Internet of Things that we see, we had, you know, the connected shoe, the connected sort of uh, home monitoring system, the connected weather stations, even DriveWise, which is this kind of connected insurance um, dongle that goes in the car, monitors your car. These things are interacting in a very kind of individualized, limited way, I would say, because the data is being driven, the value of the data is being driven through these kind of closed silos of, uh, 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 of, um, of ownership. And that's kind of problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think that's a 1950s model of... Uh, of our relationship to technology, the idea of kind of remote control, one person controlling what one's own device, one's own television, if you like. Uh, the second is that it's kind of driven by another sense of control, which is about efficiency and security and being able to kind of control stuff out there. And I think these are quite old paradigms, which are very much about either top-down or individualistic, atomized um, experiences of the world. The fact is that actually the world outside, the real world, the stuff that's going on there outside is messy. And there's diversity, there's heterogeneity, there's novelty and serendipity in our cities. This is actually what makes our cities valuable. The fact that actually in the mess and because of the mess, because of the unexpectedness of people colliding with each other or with different ideas or interacting services that don't quite line up, that, I would argue, is actually where, where, where the value of our, our kind of, uh, the, the, the real world is. And when we think about technologies to try and control this, as you know, as sometimes we want to do as engineers, we might think that the world is a problem to be solved. Um, and that if only we had the right data, the right system, the right sort of algorithm that we could control and predict and optimize and kind of solve things out there. The reason this is problematic is twofold. First of all, this language of security and optimization and control and efficiency and um, uh, safety, this is language from the 1960s that was used to sell highways and high rises. It's exactly the same argument that was made for the technological infrastructure of our cities that was supposed to make them much more regular, predictable, um, uh, and easy to manage, easy to deal with. And we know from experience, this is only 12 years later, the same uh, uh, complex, had to be pulled down because it was an environmental and a social and um, uh, a sociological failure. And I would argue that part of that is because of this kind of thinking that was very linear. It was, very, it was kind of thinking, oh, this is the problem, we solve it with this system, and then everyone's going to be happy and everything's going to work out fine, without really thinking about the complexity and, more importantly, the kind of emergent properties um, that are actually the, the stuff that makes the city most valuable. The second reason that I think it's kind of problematic is if we go back to that sort of idea of the smart city control room. And by the way, this is an image from, um, from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they, they have this sort of smart city operations room, uh, courtesy of IBM. Is that, you know, with this kind of model of uh, being able to kind of control the world and surveil the world and take, take action upon it, the way that's sold is that we're going to be able to sort of manage stuff and make sure that, you know, nothing goes wrong and predict what's going to 
uh, what's happening before it happens, etc., etc. But the reality of it, what actually happens out there in the real world, is that as a, as a direct consequence of this kind of connectedness uh, in, in, a, in a single direction, if you like, is you know governments can access all of the data that's uh, that's being generated in the city. Um, Ashley Madison, your personal data somehow leaks; it gets into other people's hands. Uh, Volkswagen, you know, to Volkswagen is now a verb. It basically means to deceive in a test by actually changing the results so that it's uh, <laughs> so that you, you pass a test unintentionally, as it were. Um, Tesla is basically beta testing features on the road. Um, this is how they're kind of like the, their their self-driving um, algorithms are are being developed. You have uh, a 15-year-old boy. Uh, able to hack into uh, a telco. Um, you have the interaction of fake news and social media and the way that people actually make decisions that then affect uh, all of us. All of this is as much the smart city as that control room and the kind of the, 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 the nice idea that everything's going to work smoothly. And so I would urge you that when, when you're thinking about connected stuff and the Internet of Things, to think about the possibilities uh, if we go in different directions about thinking about how this stuff is deployed. If you think about something like um, transportation, this is often an argument. Well, you know, it'd be so much better if we just had efficient and um, uh, transportation that arrived on time. Don't forget that, you know, Japan has had uh, uh, a great transportation probably for the last 30 or 40 years. It's not waiting for technology to solve that problem. The fact that we have transportation issues, only a tiny part of that is to do with the connected problem or the issue of not having the right data. There's a whole lot more stuff uh, to be thinking about. So, well, I'm, I'm trying to frame here uh, the way that, if you like, the, the idealism of connectedness intersects with the reality, the mess of reality. And this is not to say that there's nothing we can do. It's rather to say there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do that I just don't think that we're thinking of when we only think in terms of a person controlling a light or changing the color uh, of their light or triggering their garage door or, or, um, or monitoring their thermostat, as you might, have, uh, might be familiar with. Um, when you start to think about the way that all these things interact together. So I'm going to talk about basically six projects that are done over the years, examining different aspects of, of this kind of, uh, if you like, a kind of a, a complex series of interacting environments rather than just sort of individual things. The first thing I want to talk about, this project was it essentially kicked off through this idea of measuring and sharing rather than controlling and monitoring. Um, and it was called Patch Bay. I launched this about nine years ago. Um, it was essentially one of the first generalized Internet of Things data infrastructures um, uh, in the very early days of the industry. It was essentially a message, bro uh, a message broker and a time series database that worked with many different types of device, whether they were energy monitors, air quality monitors, um, uh, radiation sensors. Cisco used it in their urban eco map. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Current cost, which is an energy monitor, used it as their back end. Um, it was uh, used by the air quality egg, which is a citizen. Uh, sensing group around um, air quality issues, and it was eventually acquired by uh, LogMeIn in 2011. Um, but I just want to talk about one specific thing because you can see here this was the front page back in sort of 2009 or 10 or so. It was essentially uh, um, a uh, it was called the Twitter of the Internet of Things at the time that anyone could sort of push messages to and anyone could pull messages from. And there were essentially about 50,000 developers around the world, the really early adopters for the Internet of Things that were building stuff on, uh, on the system. But what was really interesting to me is what happened in Japan 
following the radiation crisis after the earthquake, uh, uh, the, um, the, the Fukushima disaster. So the citizens were desperately concerned about radiation and what they should be worrying about. And the government was getting some information out there, but it was very slow. You know, it would take several days for them to publish a single PDF about the radiation levels in an entire prefecture, which is essentially like a, um, uh, a borough. No, actually it's even bigger than a borough, what am I saying? Um, uh, and so people desperately wanted to have information about what was going on in terms of radiation. And within a couple of weeks, the Japanese community of Patch Bay had connected up about 2,000 feeds across the country. They were essentially push pushing radiation data and making it available to each other in real time. Now, where the government had only been able to get a PDF out about a value that in some cases was measured 80 meters off the ground and in other cases one meter off the ground, the community basically had mobilized to measure what was going on and make that data available to each other in real time. There was a lot of criticism at the time from you know, radiation specialists who said, this is dirty data, you know, everyone's, they, these people are not trained in what they are measuring, they might be measuring incorrectly, they're using different equipment, some are measuring in microsieverts and some are measuring in nanogray. Um, this data is, you know, basically useless. But that completely misunderstood the phenomenon that was going on, which was that people were using this to figure out what they could do themselves, to figure out not what is the kind of objective data set that they could generate across the country, but what is happening here in my home and is that value going up or down? And so the act really was one of feeling like they had agency and wanting to share that experience with each other by being able to have these kind of conversations around data. But what happened next, I think, is actually the most interesting part, which is that that was, uh, uh, you know, it became a, a massive data set. People started to build stuff on top of that data. So Haiyan Zhang built this, um, uh, this sort of map, um, which was called um, Japan Geiger Maps, I think, something like that. And it essentially looked at not just the values of um, the, the radiation levels, but also exposure times. Nobody had actually done this yet before. If you're familiar with the, uh, with the effects of radiation, you know that exposure time is as important as the, uh, um, as the levels of radiation. And so what she did was looked at exposure times and um, possible health consequences. And really this was uh, both a map to be used as well as the most important part was as a whole um, uh, uh, comment board that had thousands of comments, just people talking about what was going on and trying to make sense of what was going on. So this was important both for being a map and for being a, a location where people could coordinate and uh, discuss what they were seeing. There were other visualization tools that were created. This one looked at where the latest hotspots were. Uh, another one looked at where the trends of, of radiation um, clustered. Uh, the Winds of Fukushima Android app basically took wind direction and radiation levels to try and predict where the radiation would peak next, and so on and so forth. If you didn't have a radiation monitor, you could use the um, SMS alert app to put an SMS alert on your neighbor's uh, radiation sensor. If you didn't have a connected radiation monitor, but you had a handheld one, somebody built a form where you could type in that um, data and, and contribute it piece by piece. Uh, Yahoo Japan used the data. Um, Safecast, which was another citizen sensing organization, also used the data. So the point was that this was less about amassing a sort of a, a, a massive data set and more about the process of measuring and people just getting involved in making sense of their environment and being able to act upon it um, uh, and not having to wait for the government to provide that data. And this was, this was part of a dramatic shift, of course, in Japan, sociologically speaking, whereby, I, you know, before the disaster, the relationship of people to, to their kind of, uh, to their authority um, was different to what it has turned out to be afterwards, where there's 
much more realization that the government will not necessarily take care of, of everything. And so this was just a small slice of, of, of that process. So I hope you see, at least with this kind of first project, that this is much more than just like one person measuring something and monitoring something and just creating a graph. And it's more about what happens when lots of people are doing this stuff together. So the second thing I want to talk about is when you have these connected things that are generating data, that different people can make use of that data. What happens when you create these kind of communities of devices? What are the kinds of things that one can create when you distribute the, 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 the decision making, if you like? And so this is a project that I did in 2009, <laughs> basically using PatchBay. Um, and it was a project to kind of, on a much smaller scale than perhaps the other stuff uh, I've shown, it was a project used to kind of explore what would happen when all these things can kind of interact with each other and help us make decisions about stuff. So essentially, Natural Fuse was a plant with a power socket on it. And the amount of power available to the socket was limited by the capacity for the plant to offset its carbon footprint. Now. The idea is that all of this stuff is networked, but one lamp needs six plants to offset its carbon footprint. And so any single plant cannot on its own offset the carbon footprint of the power that's being used by its owner. But what happens is that when you plug it in and you switch on, let's say, your lamp, then it wakes up and it looks out on the network to find out if there are five other plants out there on the network that are not being used. And if they are, then it has enough carbon capturing capacity that you can just switch on your light and it goes sort of full brightness and you get as much as you need. In actual fact, there is a, uh, a button, you might have seen that dial, selfless or selfish. If there are not five plants out there to offset the carbon footprint, of the, of the individual device that you've switched on. If you've got it on selfless, then what happens is that after a few minutes, it'll switch off before it harms the carbon capturing capacity of the community. But you might have to turn it on. You might have heard an intruder in your, in your flat and you definitely need light. You choose selfish and you get as much light as you, lead, as you need, as much energy as you need. But if it ends up harming the carbon capturing capacity of the community, in other words, if it goes into the red, then it sends out a kill signal to kill somebody else's plant. And so you can see over here there's a vinegar injection that it basically <laughs> um, triggers remotely. Now in, actual, in actuality what we do is we give each plant three lives. Uh, a little bit like a video game. When you kill somebody else's, uh, one of the lives of somebody else's plant, you both get an email and um, essentially it enables the person who is whose plant has lost a life to say, hey, what the hell? You, know, you, you acted selfishly and uh, my plant lo lost a life. And that gives the opportunity for the person who had to make that decision, essentially both to be held accountable, but also to explain, well, you know, I had to do it because I, I heard an intruder in my flat. So the idea here is that the system is not making the decisions for you. You're making decisions, but through the distributing of the resource, in other words, the car carbon capturing capacity, you're able to manage the usage across the community, but also when somebody has to make a decision that acts in their own interest, they're at least held accountable and can enter into a conversation about the complexity of that decision uh, around it. So again, this is the idea of connected objects that are not just about a single owner making a single decision and getting a single uh, uh, reward. It's more about these kinds of uh, ecosystems of things. So, <clears throat> the next project I'd like to talk about is, um, is all about what happens when you have this sort of deployment of connected stuff and you think about bringing people into that process so that they can start to reconfigure the way all this stuff is connected. And this was a project that we did for Bradford. Do you know the, the Mirror Pool Park? 
um, that uh, I know it's not that far away. I don't know how, how often you guys sort of go back and forth. Um, but the Mirror Pool Park was a was a kind of a new part of the city center. Uh, there, there used to be some roads there, and they were getting rid of the roads and creating this new park with a with a pool in the middle and some fountains. And they basically had a plan for loads of technology: LEDs in the floor, colored lights, lasers, fountains, a pool that would go up and down, weather stations, cameras, and uh, what have you. Loads of connected stuff. And essentially, what we did is we um, we proposed and then deployed a kind of an operating system for connecting all this stuff up, so that the council could quite rapidly connect different things to each other, and then reconnect them, and then reconfigure them constantly. So if you wanted, for example, to take the, um, uh, the, the, the cameras and connect them to the fountains, you could actually get the fountains to respond to people as they walked past. Or you might connect the camera to the, um, to the, to the lights instead, and then you can have the lights start to, to follow people or run away from them. There's somebody, I think, uh, running past. Um, and I think in a second you'll see the lights uh, coming up. So here the lights are following someone, and then I think there's another shot where they're where they're running away. The point is that it's somebody else that's making that decision about the, how to configure it, whether the lights respond to the weather station, whether the big fountain erupts when the local team scores a goal, whether the, um, whether the fountains and the pool lights and the colors of the lights are perhaps on a different festival, uh, colors of a particular festival, or, or what have you. And the step that we're taking next is to open it up so that members of the public can start to reconfigure the way that the park will respond to them. So this is not just that the stuff is, um, is being affected by their movements or presence, but that they are changing the way that it's affected by their movement or presence, which is the point I'm trying to get across here, that once you've got this sort of connected um, network of stuff that is able to interact with each other, for me, the, 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 the question is, how do you go that next step and actually enable members of the public or other people to reconfigure the way it's all connected to each other? So this, this has been live for several years, but the opening up to the public is something that we're working on uh, 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 over the next few months. <coughs> so four, sensing and embodying. Um, <coughs> Often, you know, we think that the Internet of Things is all about data. But, of course, data being this kind of abstract concept when it comes to the real world and people interacting in it, becomes difficult to kind of make sense of these massively connected environments. And so my interest in this project is to consider how do ordinary people make sense of the much more complex processes that are going on in the environment around them? And this is a project called Cinder, which was um, done for a new school uh, on the outskirts of Cambridge, the Trumpington Community College. It was a new school coming in, there would be new students, and it was an incredibly um, uh, fun project because this building is absolutely packed with sensors and sustainability technologies of all sorts. Our task, the reason we were brought into this, was to say, well, you know, the students are coming in. They're, they're going to be about 11 years old. Um, how can they make sense of the, 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 the complexity of the technology that this building is? Um, and, and how can they understand the technology that's actually embedded in this building, the, the building management system, the fact that there's solar panels that are generating energy, et cetera, et cetera. And more importantly, not just understand it, but how can they kind of like, how can we help them feel like this is their, their building? It's, it's part of their uh, ecosystem and environment. And what we ended up doing basically was creating Cinder. Cinder is a virtual cat that prowls the corridors of um, of this school. And Cinder basically responds, here you can see it on this kind of augmented reality screen that's in the main square. 
Cinder responds to the building management system data, changing color and size and behavior, interacting in very different ways on different days of the year or uh, um, depending on the temperature, the weather, etc., etc. Now, when Cinder gets hungry, in other words, people have been interacting with her too much or maybe she's too large and has kind of used up too much energy, she might be too large because the temperature is quite high. When Cinder's um, uh, hungry, she goes hunting on the network and she disappears from the screen here and she'll pop up on one student's laptop as you saw I think in, in, the, in the screen before and basically beg for food um, which is, where was that? Yeah, so you can see over here begging for food now what happens is that the student has a decision to make based on how much energy has been captured by the solar panels on that day that's how much food they have to feed cinder so if it's been a cloudy day there might not be very much food they also have to think about if they feed cinder now how is the next person going to feed them if they give all the food now what happens if it's just before break and then during the break they're gonna, they're, lots of people are going to be interacting with her, she's going to get hungry, there's not going to be enough food to feed her afterwards. So they go through this kind of process of understanding, okay, it's a cloudy day, it has not generated that much energy, I need to be a little bit careful about how much I feed Cinder here. Um, and so this is a kind of a, a, a way of, kind of, if you like, um, uh, embodying the data in this being that they're basically going to grow up with. You know, they're, they're going to spend the next seven years as Cinder goes through all these sorts of metamorphoses, changing uh, appearance and behavior over time. Uh, perhaps in three or four years when the technology is better, the, there'll be other sort of augmented reality um, interfaces that we can use here. But essentially it's one where they're making quite crucial decisions, albeit, you know, not necessarily um, on a live being or a, or a live cat, but one which they were directly part of designing themselves. So this is a lot of the collaboration exercises you can see going on here, where they were actually ta uh, developing different behaviors for, for Cinder, uh, actually named her, um, and also there's a whole bunch of Easter eggs, for example, wearing a sombrero on a particular day, or yeah. um, wielding a lightsaber on Star Wars Day, and things like that. So two more projects I'm going to talk about. Good for time. Um, this one is kind of stretching it to call it the Internet of Things, but it is about using technology to connect people up. But the thing I was really interested in looking at here is how in deploying a bunch of connected stuff, how do you use the technology almost as an excuse for people to interact with each other. Um, and more importantly, how, do you, how can we explore how people's ownership of their own network uh, means that they have to decide how to govern it. They have to decide what it is used for. And so this project uh, called VoiceOver was in Peter Lee, um, up in East Durham, just south of uh, Newcastle. Um, and we worked there for a couple of years. We were essentially brought in to look at social cohesion issues, if you like. Um, Peter Lee and Horton are only a couple of kilometers apart, but because they've essentially been dropped off of the transportation map, uh, you know, there, there used to be a train line nearby, there isn't anything anymore. Uh, the public transportation system has been decimated. Um, uh, usage of smartphones is one of the lowest in the countries. Uh, there's very little broadband. Um, and people's sense of identity is quite fragmented. So we were brought in to kind of work with the local community on, on some stuff to, to explore these issues. And one of the things that emerged quite early on uh, was the sense of, of the lack of voice. And, um, you know, people again and again express the desire to be able the elder gen generation to tell the younger generation about the coal mining time if you like 
um, uh, people from Peter Lee and Horden to know each other. You, you know, the fact that they were only a kilometer or two away was uh, one, one of the stories we heard early on, which was quite interesting, was that there was a, a fellow who, from Peter Lee, who married a girl from Horden, and for the rest of his life became known as the guy who married the girl from, from Horton. Uh, you know, only a, a, a kilometer or two away, but that was this kind of sense of fragmentation. So the thing that kind of emerged was how can we use technology to sort of create some kind of binding uh, together through, through people's voices? And one of the earliest ideas that emerged was to take a bunch of public spaces between Peter Lee and Horton and connect them up so that when you talk in one part, the, the voice will come out in another part. But you could sort of almost use this as a way of sort of sharing communication with strangers that might be um, a kilometer so or so away. So you'd just be sort of speaking and hearing somebody that you don't necessarily see. Now this in itself is an old project. That, that kind of idea has been done since the 70s. But what we were interested to look at was how would you actually get the sound from here to here? And could we actually create a peer-to-peer -peer network that would essentially transport the sound, but more importantly, a peer-to-peer -peer network, the path of which was determined by who decided to be part of the network along the way? So we had dozens and dozens of workshops and prototypes, and I'm kind of compressing two years worth of work to get the local community involved in this. But essentially, the technology itself, which was in the form of um, these, these things that we developed that, that look like kind of an antenna that goes on the side of the house, um, and a radio box where you could listen in to the, to the, to the communication, that became almost like a, a, you know, the, the, the excuse to go and talk to your neighbor, like a cup of sugar, going and ask for a cup of sugar. You would go to your neighbor and say, hey, look, I'm part of this project called VoiceOver. We're trying to connect up Peter Lee and Horden. I'm going to be uh, hosting a fragment of the network. Uh, would you like to uh, as well? Because we need to have 10 people along this road to, to, to be able to be part of that network. Um, and what happens is that when, when you make a sound at one end of the, uh, the path, it turns into light that then bounces down the streets in and out of people's homes and comes out the, uh, in the other public space uh, sometime further away. So here you can see it kind of starting to light up. These are just some photographs. Um, I think I have some video here. You can hear that, I suppose. This is somebody singing. This was uh, people using it to tell me. This was a poem. So it was essentially a radically public communication infrastructure where members of the public owned a fragment of that network. They actually hosted it in their own residence. And so the question of what we use it for, what is the appropriate content, um, you know, should you be able to talk politics or should you not be able to talk politics? This is a big question early on. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and how should you actually govern that, govern this project? Those were the kind of absolutely crucial questions that came about um, in this project. So the technology itself that connected everyone up together was perhaps just the excuse to, um, for people to go and interact with each other. It ended up being used for all sorts of things, people telling stories, performances, bedtime stories, that was a big one. So somebody would tell a story and all the kids in the neighborhood could listen. Um, and also three cousins who had never, uh, never realized they were all living near to each other um, discovered each other on this thing. So the last project I'm going to talk about <coughs> is all about discovering and interoperating. Um, Thinkful actually, in, in a sense, was an extension from my interest in infrastructures for the Internet of Things. Uh, when I launched this in 2007-2008, um, uh, it was 
you know, basically one of the first. There was really hardly anything else out there. But by the time uh, it was acquired in 2011, and then I came out of LogMeIn uh, uh, in 2013, there were now thousands of platforms uh, for connected objects and sensors and time series databases and message buses and, and what have you. And I realized that the real challenge was to say, okay, with all of these separate infrastructures, these separate data repositories, these sort of separate systems for managing data, which exist in silos for a very good reason, which is that people, you know, they, they're concerned about their data, they want to manage it, they might have some specific industry expertise that means that the data has to be kept in a particular way. Um, data siloing essentially, you know, it does make sense, but the opportunity of the Internet of Things is when all this stuff is communicating, as I've tried to show. So, you know, buses and cars and mobile phones and weather stations and air quality monitors and traffic sensors and all this stuff essentially is able to, to, to make use of each other's data. So the real challenge in the Internet of Things, uh, I realized in 2013, was how do you find that data? How do you go out and access that data, no matter what platform it's on? Um, and then how do you actually unlock it so that the owner of that data retains full control of who can access their data and under what conditions. So the first thing we did was we launched Thinkful.net, which is basically a search engine for the Internet of Things. We indexed um, millions of resources around the world, you know, hundreds of different platforms, different smart city platforms, different IoT uh, message brokers, uh, different data repositories, and basically just make it easier for you to find the data that you want, because there's already plenty of stuff out there. If you go to thinkful.net now, you would only see public data because as a member of the public, you are only um, entitled to access public data. Um, but it's all sorts of data, air, air quality, uh, weather stations, uh, soil monitoring, um, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially what we're doing is crawling all of these networks and then indexing them. We're not aggregating that data. We're just trying to make it um, discoverable and useful. What that means is that, you know, if you are if you're trying to find air quality data near to a particular geolocation, uh, rather than needing to know about the AQICN network, Intel's air quality uh, network, uh, the air quality egg uh, system, citizen sensing network, all of these are network. Uh, sorry, all of these are indexed, and so you can just search across all those networks to find the one that's most appropriate to your need, and then go to the original data source to access it. I'm showing you the website here, but of course um, the API works in a very similar way. If it's not air quality, perhaps it's uh, radiation in Germany or um, earthquake monitors in California. Um, there's buoys in the, in the uh, Pacific. And there's also connected animals. Here's a connected shark um, that's uh, generating data. Whatever kind of data you're looking for, um, you'll find it. You, you can find data in different cities. Uh, and again, you can kind of go directly to that data source to, to make use of it. Now, that was where we started from. Um, essentially, where we have uh, ended up is with this kind of system, which is more than just a, a search engine, which has all sorts of issues around it. And instead, we're focusing on the fact that we've, we've got these kind of tool sets for interoperability, meaning you know dealing with lots of different data formats, different data protocols, different... Um, transport layers even, uh, for entitlement, which means um, enabling the owners of data to control who, where, and when, uh, and how their data is accessed by others. So you can imagine that if you have a heart rate monitor, for example, you might want your doctor to have access to it in real time at high resolution. Uh, you might make that data available to your family in high resolution, but delayed by a week so that they don't freak out every time you go for a run. Um, you might make it available anonymized to a research project, and you might sell it to a commercial uh, organization that is using that data. So that's entitlement. And really, uh, the, the flip side to being a discoverability engine is, is how do you manage being found in the Internet of Things? And then finally, the stuff that we're working on at the moment um, is essentially a kind of semantic ontology tool set, which is a way when you have a deployment, uh, a kind of a messy 
IoT deployment to start to cluster and organize that data so that, you know, in, in the most kind of pr prosaic example I could give, if you've got a bunch of sensors that, are, that call themselves Celsius and others that call themselves Fahrenheit, you can uh, essentially put those into the same domain um, and, and have them interact together. Now, where this becomes um, most interesting for us is in connected and autonomous vehicles. So, uh, we, we, we just finished a project and we're going to be starting another one um, that does two things. Now, the first thing uh, it does is for a connected car that's moving through space uh, that needs to interact with different data services and they're kind of unpredictable data services because uh, you know you could imagine that for a high-end car that needs to look for air quality data to sort of trigger um, uh, different air conditioning settings they would have to between you know if a car was driving between London and um, and Edinburgh they would have to code for about eight different air quality networks just to get sufficient coverage so one half of this project is basically um, providing a unified interface for the car to find the data that it needs no matter where it is um, geographically. But the other side of the project, which is the much more interesting one for me, is the fact that the car itself is generating data that's valuable to others. So it's generating headlight data, wiper data, fog light data, engine data, etc., etc. Now, um, you know, this goes far beyond just the idea that you can sort of have uh, insurance, uh, driving base insurance. Because here you're thinking about the car itself as a sensor generating geographical time series data that's valuable outside of its own <coughs> network. So for example, um, the data from the car about fog lights and uh, wipers is incredibly valuable to weather services because they can ground truth the forecasts that they've made. Uh, you know, the Met Office has only got their, their calibrated stations at roughly a resolution of about 20 kilometers. So having access to all the sort of high resolution ground truth data in between is, is a very valuable um, uh, thing. And so building basically these tools for the car owner to control what happens to their data and where it goes and under what terms and what resolution, what anonymity profile, etc., etc., becomes you know, actually what makes the car data most valuable. Because otherwise, uh, it's relegated to the sort of single um, uh, data repo siloed data going to the insurance company and that's it. Um, so what we're trying to do is essentially break out of that. And so with that, just to summarize, um, I uh, just wanted to remind that you know, we talked first about the idea of the Internet of Things, not for data collection, but for measuring and sharing. That was uh, with Patch Bay. Uh, second, we talked about the idea of the Internet of Things for deciding and distributing. That was the Natural Fuse project, the plant with the power socket. Uh, we talked about um, opening and reco reconfiguring, like in Bradford. Uh, where there was a bunch of connected stuff and it was opened up for other people to reconfigure. In Cinder in Cambridge, that data was used to kind of s for, for, for the students to make sense of an embodiment of that data. Um, uh, in VoiceOver, the one up in East Durham, the, 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 the sort of the public communication network was all about connecting people together rather than things and looking at how they govern that infrastructure. And then finally, Thinkful is all about discovering and interoperating. And so collectively, I think of these things not so much as Internet of Things, but kind of ecosystems of environments, a sort of much more complex relationship between all this connected stuff, which is messy. It is kind of unpredictable. It is kind of heterogeneous. Um, but I do think it's possible for us to build technologies that, uh, that actually not, not just um, uh, allow for these kinds of things, but actually embrace and thrive on that kind of messiness. Thank you very much. I think there's some questions. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, Do people have questions for Uzman?
I know. Okay, right. We're going to try this. I'm going to run up here. I'm going to give you this microphone so you can ask the question, and I'm going to turn the other one on so we can have two going. Thank you. Uh, a fascinating talk. Um, I'm uh, designing a course for undergraduates in the Internet of Things running from this August, this autumn. Uh, we're planning on giving away a device like the one that Microsoft have kindly provided us with, this ESP8266. And I was wondering if you thought um, that the approach that you took with Cinder would be something that uh, would work uh, with, with, with older students as well. We have a built-in monitoring system, for example, uh, where we've got access to the data. And we were thinking of giving the kids these devices and getting them to build systems so that they could walk around the building and so on. Do you think you could adapt what you did with Cinder to, to that kind of context? Yeah, I think it, I mean, it, it could definitely be adapted <coughs> in principle. Um, but I think that the opportunity that you're, you're presented with is a really interesting one where I would, be, I would love to look at how the students might imagine different ways to be connected to each other and not just the building. That was something we didn't get to in Cinder, you know, because it became a representation of the building that the individual experienced and they were making a decision based on the other <coughs> students, but they weren't necessarily interacting with the students uh, beyond that. So I think, you know, especially if they are almost building up from first principles, it'd be great to see them, you know, first looking at remote sensing, secondly, kind of connecting to each other in some way and making, almost I could imagine, sort of a, a, a social wearables kind of idea uh, where they might, yeah, I suppose you're familiar with the micro bit, um, you know, something like that where they could start to, to, to do stuff with each other, not just the, the, the building itself. I guess following on from that, when you've got that opportunity to go in um, on the ground, so you're not trying to do something which is in response to something else, what are the best ways of getting uh, the people um, who are going to be hopefully the benefactors of, of uh, these kind of interventions uh, actually actively engaged in defining what it is they'd like to see and what it is that they'd like to, to create? So the most important thing, I think, is... Um Asking them what decision are you trying to make? I think the, the one, of the, one of the problems with, uh, with technolo technological interventions is quite often you think you know the problem and you've got the technology to solve that problem. And then when you kind of introduce it into the real world, it turns out that's not the problem at all. And I've got, uh, I can talk about a thousand different examples of that. But when you actually go in it and, and, and work with people and say, okay, what, what problem are you trying to solve or what decision are you trying to make? And if you constantly question, how do they use this thing um, uh, to, you know, to, to, to actually interrogate a hypothesis rather than just to decide on their behalf, if you see what I mean. That's what I find most productive because then people feel more empowered. They're making a decision about themselves, but they're also kind of testing the world through this thing and seeing whether something works. I think you know, air quality is a classic example of this. The, the, there's so many deployments where technolo you know, technology is supposed to somehow solve it and people deploy a bunch of sensors and create a map, but nobody's making any decisions uh, that actually change the air quality based on those okay. maps. Okay, other questions? Uh, yeah, I see James with his hand up there. <coughs> Am I okay to project or should I wait uh, for the... If you could wait for the microphone. You can project pretty well though. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, yeah. So um, we've been having some interesting chats on the Slack uh, back channel for the conference. Uh, and one of the things that came up there, um, you presented lots of awesome stuff that worked really well. And we were thinking we would learn more from you if you talked about some of the things in those projects that you were disappointed by or that sucked or you, you wish you'd done differently. So, do you want to you speak to some of your failures? That's, that, no, that's a great question. I do actually have a, I, there's a talk I have given called The Chronicle of Failures. Um, because, in a sense, every single project um, uh, has things that don't work out. And to a certain extent, one of the, uh, one of the <laughs> if you like, one of the talents I think I've had to develop is to take things that fail and turn it into, uh, <laughs> you know, I I into something new. Um, uh, let me think. What, 
Well, okay, so if we think about natural fuse, for example, uh, I, can, I, I can remember that, that we, one of, the, one of the issues with natural fuse is I had hoped that we could scale up that paradigm. And so we thought about, you know, people that even propose, oh, what if this was done with forests instead of plants and things like that, or on a much wider scale. And for two reasons, that did not work conceptually. Um, the first is that the reason that the Natural Fuse project does work is because you are, as an individual, responsible for this thing in your home, and you are kind of attached to it, if you see what I mean. When we had a unit that was in public space, uh, people always put it onto <laughs> selfish. Um, that, you know, it was just, when you have no accountability, then you, know, you, you have no reason to, to cooperate. And so thinking about how to scale that uh, didn't, didn't actually work. Um, and secondly, actually, the, just the mechanics of, uh, of the, the carbon ca calculation at a m much larger scale didn't, di didn't scale in the same way. Um, Dar the project in Durham was phenomenally complex because our local partner actually ran out of money uh, and couldn't support on the ground. Um, so all that kind of community development uh, and interaction, which we'd hope to have a local partner more embedded in the community to, to be working with, actually had to withdraw um, at one of the most crucial phases. So we had to go up there and embed ourselves in there. Um, in that case, in that project, there was so much technical failure as well. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer network, and actually in many of these kinds of projects of this scale, you actually cannot, and this might actually be an interesting question in the context of sustainability of software. Uh, in many cases, you cannot sufficiently test what you're doing until you actually put it into the real world. So we did dozens of tests in the studio, and then along our street outside the studio, and then we even went out into a field in the middle of Oxfordshire, which is, you know, it's only an hour away from, from our studio, in order to test the technology. But what happened on the ground was completely different. Um, and so uh, this question of, of, of actually maintaining the integrity of what you had designed and what actually gets uh, uh, installed in the real world, where you have Buildings made of lots of different materials. You have weather, well, north, nor, you know, the, the weather of the northeast, um, where you have um, people kind of willfully pulling stuff down that's kind of installed in public space. You know, all these sorts of things actually need to be uh, designed and planned for, and you don't often have uh, the, the chance to do it. I, I have a very long list of failures, which I, which I could uh, t tell you about. I think we have time for two more questions. And a reminder that uh, Usman and uh, a number of other people will be speaking on a panel this afternoon as well. So if you have other questions that, that you come up with, please, please hold them in uh, for the panel later as well. Okay. Yeah, so I guess I wanted to follow up a little bit on the same, on a similar topic and, and go to the, uh, the cat cinder. Um, and so I'm curious, not technically, because it, it, I think technically this worked really well, but socially, what was the really what was the consequence of this in terms of the students? And if you were trying to get to that <coughs> consequence, were there, would there be things that you might have done differently technically? So I guess in Cinder, what you see at the end, the manifestation of the, of the kind of technical thing that's put into the school, is really just the culmination of a two-year process of working with the group of students who were going to be incoming into the, uh, into the school. So they were involved in it every step of the way, if you see what I mean. Um, and uh, so I think I showed some of the, the shots there from the kind of workshops and exercises we went through. And we started off with these really vague um, uh, exercises with them, just saying, you know, what is the point of even doing um, uh, a, let's say a, a technology artwork. Like, does that even make any sense? Um, what is the thing that uh, that would 
that you would like to see in your new school? I think at that stage somebody mentioned, oh, are we going to have a pet? Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, it went through that, and then you know, what what kind of animal? You know, what what what, what might Cinder do on a cold day? What what might she do on a on a warm day? Um, what is the thing that you would like to do with her, or interact? How would you like to interact with her, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think the consequence of the project, I hope, and anecdotally this seems to have kind of worked out, is that they really feel like it's theirs. I mean, it's their project. I don't think they think about it as, oh, some, you know, some, some technology has been put into our space. It's this kind of sense of ownership and pride. Um, you know, they often kind of cluster around and want to show other people how to, how, you know, how to uh, attract her over here or, or, or what have you. Um, I think that, technically speaking, what I would have liked to do, which I think I mentioned to the other person who asked the question, is take it a step further and have them making a decision about something to do with the building resource itself. You know, actually get them making a decision that impacts, I don't know, the light levels or you know, the energy expenditure or something like that. Um, because that would have closed that loop. Uh, but yeah. Okay. One last question. Yeah. Should we just go or wait for mine? Oh. You can start. So far, it's the opposite side. I I just latched, I'm just latching on to, to one particular thing you said about uh, when uh, when there's no accountability, we won't see cooperation emerge. Um, I'm probably latching on to that because that's my research field in in game theory. Uh, but I was going to ask on a similar vein to talk about your failures, have you actually ever uh, put in a system where you thought the individual agents, individual elements would act a certain way and then you were surprised by how they acted? So either all of a sudden cooperation did occur or... Every something. single project, I have to say. So um, I'll talk about two projects I didn't show. Uh, one was that project in... Singapore. I showed just the, the shot right at the beginning, the 18-story structure. It's called Burble. Now, when we were kind of thinking about it, designing it, and building it in, in London, you know, the idea was that they would design something and then build it themselves in public space and then erect this 18-story thing, and it's filled with sensors, and they could sort of control it with the handlebar that's sort of sending these colors up and sort of mixing in a way, because it's all basically a cellular automata, so the way that they configure is based on explicitly on how they've kind of designed it all to fit together. What we totally failed to take account of was that the people interacting with this thing couldn't see it, <laughs> right? Because they're right there. The people with the best view of it uh, were several hundred meters back. So, so that was one uh, interesting thing. Um, a second project, and this would be interesting, I think, from a game theory perspective, because we were ex intentionally uh, looking at um, Prisoner's Dilemma, uh, was a project called Transformer, which you, you can find on the website. But basically, it was a game played with 18 people, and it was played in the dark, and everyone had this kind of w set of wearable sensors that would give them feedback in the form of buzzing and vibrations and things like that, about um, uh, basically about how much energy that they had expended. They had to find tokens in the dark with a little light that was at the end of their hand. But the more, act the more that they kind of um, moved, the more energy they used up, the less capacity they had to find the tokens. So we were interested to look at how people would cooperate to you know, share energy resources or to share tokens. Um, and there we found sort of dozens of paradigms that we just never expected, um, which might actually be predictable from the mathematics. But things like, you know, where uh, there, was the, there, there was the algorithm where one person would just stand still and a whole bunch of other people would use their lights and then just go and, ha and put all the tokens on the one person and share the reward later on and so on and so forth. So all of that was... Uh, uh, kind of emergent from, from that and, and kind of unpredictable from our perspective. Okay. Um, let's all thank Usman again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we were pretty much all day, so grab me if you want to. Uh,
uh, chat about anything. We do. And, and yes, we, we have the panel later on um, after the second keynote in the afternoon. Uh, before we break for lunch, I'd like to pass over to Shuei, who's got a couple of announcements.